dividend is when a corporation takes some money of its earnings and gives it back to shareholders as a return on their investment. It is not an expense. It doesn't go in the income statement. Instead, it goes in the retained earnings statement and it makes my retained earnings go down. Dividends have to be declared by the board. They don't happen automatically. They must be declared. In order to pay a cash dividend, well, you got to have cash. You also have to have retained earnings. If you think back to chapter four, when we weren't closing entries, we closed dividends out to retained earnings. You've got to have sufficient cash and retained earnings to pay a dividend. We can only pay dividends that exceed what we have in retained earnings when we're going out of business. That's kind of liquidating dividend. The first thing we need to do then is to calculate the amounts for my dividends. Then we'll make journal entries is the last thing we cover today. Remember, preferred stockholders have preference. They get what is owed to them before common stockholders get anything. Preferred stock can be stated one of two ways. Number one, it could be stated as a certain dollar amount of dividends per share. So we could say it's $2 preferred stock. That would mean that the annual dividend is $2 a share. The way it usually is stated is as a percent. And if it's stated as a percent, that's a percent of our par value. So we have an example here where we issue 3% $200 par value preferred stock. What is my annual dividend a share? $200 par times 3% says each year we're going to pay a $6 dividend. Now that might be $6 all at once during the year, or it might be what, $1.50 per quarter. So what do we do? We took the percent times the par value. Preferred stock is usually cumulative. Cumulative preferred stock says, if I don't declare the dividend one year, it falls into arrears. What does it mean if something is in arrears? It's behind. Is it a good thing for your bills to be in arrears? No, that's not a good thing. So if we don't declare my preferred dividend one year, it falls in arrears, we're behind, but it doesn't go away. We still owe that amount. So cumulative preferred stock, if we don't declare a dividend, we still owe it. That amount goes into arrears. Before we can ever give anything to my common stockholders, I've got to catch up all my dividends in arrears plus pay the current year. If we're behind in paying our dividends, that sounds like a liability, but it actually is not because dividends only become a liability to me when I declare them. I haven't declared these yet, so they are not a liability. So if we're going to pay a dividend to our common stockholders, we have to first catch up everything I owe to the preferred. What I owe to the preferred is their dividends and arrears plus the current year amount. Preferred stock could be non-cumulative. If it is non-cumulative and we don't declare the dividend one year, tough luck, it's gone. You don't get it. So if you were a stockholder looking to buy preferred stock, would you prefer that that preferred stock be cumulative or non-cumulative? Cumulative, because if they don't declare it one year, you're still going to get your money later on. If it's non-cumulative and they don't declare it, you're out of luck. All right, let's do an example. 10,000 shares, 4%, $50 par value, cumulative preferred stock outstanding. 40,000 shares of common stock. Dividends are in arrears for 2015, 2016. We didn't declare or pay dividends. It's now 2017 and we have some money. We have $70,000 cash. We need to decide how much of that goes to the preferred and then how much of that is going to go to my common stockholders. The first thing I want you to calculate is how much I should pay per share of preferred stock each year. $2. $50 par times 4% says I'm going to pay $2 per share. How much should I pay in total? Well, it's $2 a share and I have 10,000 shares of preferred stock outstanding. I should be paying $20,000 a year in preferred dividends. How much am I in arrears? Well, I'm behind by how many years? Two. 20,000 times two years says right now I am behind by $40,000. When 2017 rolls around, and we have some money to pay a dividend. Not only do I have to pay them the 40,000 that we are behind, I also have to pay them the current year dividend. So I've got to pay the preferred folks the 40,000 I am behind plus the 20,000 for this year. So if I want to pay a dividend, I've got to give 60,000 of it to the preferred. How much would that be per share? Well, we'll take the 60,000. Let's divide by my number of preferred shares outstanding. And do you get $6 per share? 60,000 divided by 10,000, $6 a share, which makes sense, right? Because it was $2 a year and we have three years worth. 
Well, how much would the common stockholders get this year then? 10,000, because we had 70,000 available, 60 went to the preferred, the rest of it goes to the common. Do you see how the common stockholders get the residual or the leftovers? Doesn't sound so hot here, but what if they had had a million dollars available this year? Well, then that would be a great big chunk to go to the common stockholders, wouldn't it? So when times are hard, they don't get much, but when times are good, the sky's the limit. There is no maximum amount. How about my preferred stockholders? Basically, they're gonna get 20,000 a year, whether the times are good or bad. When times are bad, they're gonna get their 20,000. They might have to wait a couple years, but they're gonna get it. When times are good, are they gonna share in the extra wealth? No, nope, they're just gonna get their 20,000. How much is that per share of common stock? Well, we'll take the 10,000, divide it by 40,000 shares, says we're gonna receive 25 cents per share. Let's continue that example, but now, that preferred stock was not cumulative, it is non-cumulative. We still have 70,000 available to pay. How much would go to the preferred stockholders? 20. They get their current year amount only. How about the other two years? Well, tough luck, it's gone. How much will the common folks get then? 50. We had 70,000, 20 of it went to the preferred, we only have 50 then for the common. So if I was a common stockholder and my company also has preferred stock outstanding, would I rather that preferred stock be cumulative or non-cumulative? Non-cumulative, because greedy, that's more money for me then. All right, our next example is a little bit more complicated. We're gonna take it one step at a time. For each year, I'm gonna ask you one question after another after another. We have 3,000 shares, 5%, $100 par value, cumulative preferred stock. We also have 10,000 shares of common stock outstanding. Here's how much money I have available to pay dividends. Zero, zero, 12, 40, 60, 80. What we want to know is for each year, year one through six, how much goes to the common and how much to the preferred. The first thing I want you to calculate is what is my annual preferred dividend per share? And when you finish that, I want you to go to the next step and tell me my total preferred dividend per year. What's my annual dividend per share? $100 par times 5% says for each share of preferred stock, I will be paying $5 per share per year. My total annual dividend on the preferred stock would be how much? 15. $5 a share times 3,000 shares outstanding, $15,000 a year. It's really important that we get that number right. If you miss this number, everything else we do is gonna be wrong from here on out. So. You understand the amount per share is the par value times the percent. The amount in total, you multiply by the number of shares. Got to get that number right. If you miss this one, everything else is going to be wrong. Put a little star by that 15,000. We're going to use that number over and over and over again. Year one, we have no money to pay them. How much do we owe the preferred at the end of year one? 15. How much will we pay them? Zero. How much are we in arrears? We should have paid them 15, we paid them zero, we're behind by 15. And how much will we give to the common? Zero. So we should have paid the preferred 15, we didn't, so we are now behind by 15. Year two rolls around. How much do we owe the preferred folks at the end of year two? 30. 15 from last year plus 15 from this year, we owe them 30. How much are we going to pay the preferred folks? Zero. Don't have anything. How far behind are we now? 30. We were supposed to give them 30. We gave them nothing. We're behind by 30. How much goes to the common? Let's go to year three. How much do we owe the preferred now? 45. We were behind by 30 plus another 15 for this year. says we owe them 45. How much are we going to pay? 12, because that's all we have. How much behind are we now? 33. <laughs> we should have paid them 45. We only paid them 12. We're behind by 33. How much goes to the common year three? Zero. We talked about it in the pecking order, commas at the bottom. Do you see that? Preferred got something this year, common didn't get anything. Year four, $40,000 we have. How much do we owe to the preferred? 48. We owed them 33 from last year. We were behind by 33. Plus, we owe them 15 for this year. We owe them 48. How much are we going to give them? We have 40. They get all of it still. Well, how much behind are we? Hey, we should have given them 48. We only gave them 40. We are now behind by eight. How much goes to the common? Year four. Year five. We got 60,000 this year. How much do we owe to the preferred? 23. We were behind by eight plus 15 for the current year says we owe them 23. How much can we pay them this year? 23. We had 60. We could pay them 
everything that we owe them. We are finally caught up. How much are we in arrears now? Zero. How about the common? Will they get anything now? Yeah, we have 60,000. Only 23 of that goes to the preferred. 37 then would remain for the common. We're six. How much do we owe the preferred? Just the current year, the 15 amount. That's all. How much are we going to give them? 15. How much are we behind? Zero. How much goes to the common? Well, we had 80. 15 of that's going to be earmarked for the preferred. The common gets 65. So when times were bad, if there wasn't any money at all, it went to the preferred folks. When times are great, the preferred folks get, what, their 15000 a year? Common folks are making that like a bandit by the time we get to the end here, aren't they? They have the residual ownership. Common stockholders do. There is no minimum amount of dividends, but there also is no maximum. The sky is the limit of this one. The other way a common stock dividend could be, if I've always been paying 20 cents a share, and I've got, let's say, 100,000 shares outstanding, and I want to keep paying 20 cents a share, I could just multiply the number of shares times what I want to pay. Okay, so if I already know in advance how much I want to pay per share, I can multiply that by the number of shares. When I ask you this, I was asking you in total how much goes to the preferred and how much goes to the common. Your textbook sometime will ask you how much is the dividend per share. If you want to know what it is per share, well, you're going to take the total dividend and divide by the number of shares. So again, Ed makes a good point. Sometime in a problem, if we're trying to keep it really simple, we could simply tell you you're paying a dividend of 20 cents a share on the common stock. You take the number of shares times 20 cents, and that's a dividend you're going to pay. The assumption here is that we have a limited pool of money to pay, and we got to decide how much goes each way. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about today will be the journal entries in for a cash dividend. We pulled this from another paper years ago. Scan it declares a dividend. On Thursday, I don't know when Thursday was, but on Thursday, they declared a cash dividend, 32 and a half cents a share. Dividends payable October 1st to shareholders of record at the close of business on September 10th. What I want you to see right now is that we have three dates involved. One date is Thursday. I don't know when Thursday was, but it was prior to September 10th. The second date is September 10th, and the third date is October 1st. The three dates. The date of declaration is the date that the board declares that they're going to pay a dividend. On that day, we become legally liable to pay. Now let's back up first. So let's go back to Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, when we talked about dividends, we would say we paid $500 dividends would be a transaction I would give you. What would that look like when I said we paid $500 dividends? What account did you debit? Mm -hmm. Dividends. We debited dividends. Good. What do we credit? We credited cash. So back in Chapter 2, we'd make it really short. We'd say we paid dividends. You debit dividends and you credit cash. Now, I've just told you there's a time delay from when I declare it to when I pay it. So we're going to change that up a little bit. Instead, when I declare the dividend, instead of debiting an account just called dividends, I'm going to debit an account called cash dividends. Okay, first off, why the word cash? Because there's an alternative to cash. There's cash dividends and there's stock dividends. So I have to say this is cash dividends. Your book simply calls that account cash dividends. I like to call it cash dividends declared because the credit goes to an account called cash dividends payable. We haven't paid it yet and we owe it. That's why I credit cash dividends payable. You can debit either simply cash dividends. I think if you put the word declared on it, I think it's going to help you keep things straight a little bit. Otherwise, people confuse the declared and the payable. When we declare the dividend, I'm going to debit cash dividends declared, which is like dividends was to us in Chapter 2, and I'm going to credit cash dividends payable. Cash dividends payable is a liability. Why well, credit a liability? We owe it. We're legally obligated to pay it. Cash dividends declared. Temporary stockholders equity account. When we make our closing entries, R-E-I-D, cash dividends declared is the account we're going to close out now. Instead of playing dividends, we're now going to call it cash dividends declared. The date of record is the date on which we make a list of who owns our stock. Now, if you think about it with corporations, their stock is trading constantly as long as the stock exchanges are open. Remember when we looked at a few companies the other day, we could look and see the price change just by a penny or two. That's because somebody had just sold some shares to someone else. They're constantly changing hands. At some point, I've got to draw a line in the sand somewhere and say, okay, if you own the stock on this date, you're going to get the dividend. If you don't own the stock on this date, you don't get the dividend. So the date of record is the date on which we decide who gets the dividend. At the close of business on that day, who owns my stock? They're the one who's going to get the dividend. On that day, we don't make a journal entry. Instead, we make a list of who owns our stock. 
no journal entry. We just make a list. The ones are. Now, what if the stock changes hands after the date of record, but before the dividend is paid? Will the person who's buying the stock then get the dividend? No, we sell that. We say that stock sells X dividend. X means without. The person who is buying that stock knows they're not going to get the dividend. Finally, we have the date of payment. The date of payment is the date on which we write the dividend checks. We're going to satisfy our liability. We're going to debit that payable to make it go down. We're going to put cash to make the asset go down. May 1st, declare $10,000 cash dividend. Now, let me stop right there. I'm keeping it really simple. I'm not even differentiating common and preferred. I might, ha if I have preferred stock, I would have to decide how much of my 10,000 goes to the preferred and how much of it goes to common. I'm just going to assume it's all going to the same place right now. We declare a 10,000 dividend to stockholders of record on May 15th to be paid on June 1st. On the date that I declare the dividend, I debit what? Cash dividends declared. We have to add the word cash because it's not a stock dividend. We've got to differentiate. And it is declared, which makes it just like my plain old dividends account back in chapter two. I haven't paid it yet. I can't credit cash, but I owe it. My credit goes to cash dividends payable. Debit cash dividends declared, credit cash dividends payable. I have not paid it yet. I am legally obligated to pay it at this point. Date of record. What sort of entry do we make on the date of record? Trick question. No entry. I will ask you that point blank on the test. I'll say, what's the journal entry? And you're going to say, no entry. What do we do instead of making a journal entry? We make a list, just like Santa makes a list and checks it twice. We're going to make a list of who owns our stock. At the close of business on that day, who owns my stock? So tell me this. If you were thinking about buying a share of this stock, would you be willing to pay more for this stock on May 15th or on May 16th? 15th. Why is that? Because in about two weeks, you're fixing to get a dividend. So really, the stock price will be impacted by the amount of the dividend. We won't get into all that discussion. It will be more complicated, but it does impact the stock price because people who buy it after that date don't get that dividend. So they're not going to be willing to pay quite as much for it. The entry to record paying the dividend. What account do we need to wipe off of our books once we make this payment? The payable. Good. We'll go debit cash dividends payable to make that liability go down. And what do I have less of? Cash. We need to make the asset go down with a debit cash dividends payable to make the liability go down, credit cash to make the asset go down. Finally, let's make the closing entry. We did that back in Chapter 4. Remember REID, the fourth closing entry, closed out dividends. Let's review. What did that look like? Debit what? Retained earnings. Very good. We're still with debit retained earnings. What did we credit back in Chapter 4 in that fourth entry? Dividends. And now we no longer have an account called dividends. The one that's taken its place is cash dividends declared. I like to put the word declared on it because declared and dividends both start with D. And we're still closing out one of those D words in. Cash dividends declared. Now I want you to look back at that sheet for the entries we just made. Three journal entries. And let's think about the overall impact of those journal entries. First off, what is the cumulative effect on cash dividends payable of those entries. Zero. We credited it, we debited it, it's down to zero, right? How about cash dividends declared? What's the net effect on that account? Zero. We debited it, we credited it, it's down to zero. What is the overall impact on cash of those entries? It's gone down. What's the overall impact on retained earnings? It's gone down. So the overall impact of all those journal entries is that cash goes down and retained earnings goes down. That is the net impact then of declaring and paying a cash dividend. We have less cash and we have less retained earnings.